Good morning, church. How's everybody today? Good morning. Awesome. Yeah, a little white and fluffy out this morning. Yeah. You know, quite a contrast to what I had. I had 65 degree temperatures down in Nashville this week. And and so I come back to Iowa and, and the penguins were walking down the sidewalk. So I take pictures of that. So. But you like penguins. I love penguins, yeah. I didn't say I didn't like them, but, you know. Rather not see him walking around the yard or anything like that. So, anyway, uh, what a wonderful week we have in store for us. God has got all kinds of great things planned for us. Can't wait to find out what they are as He reveals them to us in here. Um, I did kind of have a public service announcement for first thing this morning here. Uh, due to the shortage of eggs that there are right now nationwide, the NFL has said. Quarterbacks are not allowed to scramble anymore. So uh, I figured I'd pass that on. Grown? Oh, come on. Oh, yeah, that's as good as it gets, too. So. <laughs> you should have warned me. I would have had like a. Sound for you. Oh, anyway, we welcome you, whether you're here with us in person today or online we we thank you for joining us this morning here and uh just kind of have to have a little bit of fun and a little bit of levity to to break up the day so start? uh you know, well as soon as i get done here terry's giving the message so Ooh, i'm on fire <laughs> There's something. oh yeah i'm some already Anyway, let's get to the announcements uh, <laughs> before I say anything more. Uh, men's breakfast is going to be here February 4th. Now, I found out this morning because I checked on the status of it. And <laughs> just in case. Yes. <laughs> oh, okay. So the, the griddle will not be showing up until around the mid-February, so we won't be having pancakes here this time. We're going to have to just stick with biscuits and gravy, and and uh, that's always going to be the right thing. So, Anyway, men's breakfast, February 4th, 9 a.m., right here. And uh, so it's always a, a really good time. The women need to catch on to this and start having their women's group meetings and uh, possibly a breakfast. And I kind of threw it out to the guys this last time around that maybe what we're going to have to do is we'll just have to get everybody together, and we will... The men will cook breakfast for the ladies and have them here to kind of get them acclimated to what it's like. So um, I didn't get anybody pushed back on it, so I think, I think that might happen. Orange Track Racing is going to start up its 18th season, February 11th. And if you want more information, uh, orangetrackracing.org. And you can go on the website there and take a look at all the fun things. Uh, I don't think we did any class changes or anything, right? So everything's going to be the same this year, so it's going to be really nice. Then April 1st, the men of Grace Street Church will be attending Iron Sharpens Iron. And if you have anyone that you would, would like to have come along, bring guests. They're welcome. Um, we need to have 10 in order to get our discount on the tickets. And uh, so we're looking forward to that as well. So if you know anybody who wants to sign up to go we have a sign up sheet right there i think we passed around last week so we should be good um so today is the day that the lord has made let us rejoice and be glad in it uh our call to worship that pastor terry uh sent me comes from micah 7 verse 7 from the new living translation it says as for me i look to the lord for help I wait confidently for God to save me, and my God will certainly hear me. And so if we think about that, it, it kind of gives that overtone of, okay, I know what, what's going to be coming down the road here. i, I got to wait for God's timing now. And that's kind of critical in our lives because we try and make God fit our timing. And it's just the opposite way around. We have to fit God's timing. So Terry's message for today is while we wait. And in this section of Micah, uh, it is Almighty God, our Savior, who we have to keep forefront of our minds as we're doing these things. 
Almighty God. We kind of shorten it down to just God. But Almighty God is our Savior, and we wait upon Him. So in the midst of a total moral collapse, is what Michael was writing this in there. They had a moral collapse in that society, not unlike what we're kind of going through today. God's faithful have only one hope for all of those things. The one true God is the Savior who hears our cries for help and will deliver us from the evils that we're having to live within at the time. And this is what Michael was reminding the people of at this point in time. You have a Savior in God. You, you need to keep your faith and your trust in Almighty God because he's bigger than any of these other issues that the people were facing. And again, if we look in Jeremiah 50, verse 34, they were going through the same thing. So Jeremiah was saying, hey, hey, people, take a listen. At any particular moment in history, the enemies of God's people will come up and rise up against us and will try and oppress God's people. And so last week I kind of talked about that. Talk with my hand, I don't know. So, um, and we really truly are in those times right now and we've been in them for over a hundred years so we have to wait for God to act because it tells us in his word here he is going to act and he will take care of this situation for us so we are in those times now and a lot of people say well you know uh, it's a sign of God's weakness because he's not doing anything about all this no matter how much we pray to him no matter how much we do but we have to understand, when he chooses the time, when the time is right, he will choose. And he will act to redeem his people and punish their enemies. And this is what Jeremiah was talking about, and this is what Micah is talking about as well. So the gods of the nations at that point in time are helpless and worthless. Because they do not rise up to what Almighty God is. But God is the savior of his people. He can be depended upon, and so we wait. And that's kind of where, where we want to be, is we, we want to wait for God to come and act. We don't want to try and hurry things along. We have to be patient. Patience is a virtue. Have some sun there. So as we wait, we'll hear that message from Terry today. Let's open with a word of prayer. Lord, we call upon your mercy. A stricken nation returns to our only hope, to you, God himself. And in these times of moral confusion and rebellion, we the faithful still turn to you, Father God, in hope and in desperation. We call upon your goodness and your mercy, and we call upon your grace to see us through and to deliver us from the brokenness of this world. We ask for your presence here today by the power of the Holy Spirit. Guide and direct us today and in all of our days ahead. Lord, bring that to us today. Bless Pastor Terry as he gives us the message that you have put on his heart to deliver. And bless us in worship today. In Jesus' name. It's interesting to think about all the things that we wait for. We wait, some of us wait for the bus, which is never any fun. I remember when we, we were on a trip and we waited for an Uber, first time we ever did that, that was interesting. Um, when you're at work, how often, especially if you don't really care for your job, how often are you going, is it time for break yet? <coughs> like, time for lunch. How often do we look forward to and, and, and we are uh, waiting so we can go on vacation? Or even a staycation, just staying at home and doing things around the house. How often do we wait to do time, uh, things with family? So uh, last weekend, we had waited and waited and waited to have our Christmas with our kids and our grandkids. And finally, last Saturday was the day. And now it's over. This morning, uh, 
I looked out the window and it's like, uh, no, I'm gonna have to shovel. I'm gonna have to clean up the garbage, do a little shoveling. All right, but first, time with the Lord. So I went and immediately went to my devotional and I'm doing, um, it's with Nikki Gumbel, it's the Bible in one year. And this was the, uh, the opening part of the devotion was this, how long, O Lord? All right, I'm captivated immediately. And he says this, have, have there ever been times in your life when you have found yourself wondering how long, O Lord? How long will this pandemic last? How long will these struggles and disappointments last? How long will we have these financial difficulties? How long will these health issues present? And he went, how long, how long, how long, through several different things. And I went, okay, okay, Lord, I'm, I'm, I'm with you, okay. I just got my confirmation that I'm okay with. This wasn't my message. That's always a good confirmation. And then he went straight to Psalm 13. He says, Oh Lord, how long will you forget me forever? How long will you look the other way? How long must I struggle with anguish in my soul, with sorrow in my heart every day? How long will my enemy have the upper hand? Turn and answer me, O oh Lord my God. Restore the sparkle to my eyes or I will die. Don't let my enemies gloat saying we have defeated him. Don't let them rejoice at my downfall, but I trust in your unfailing love. I will rejoice because you have rescued me. I will sing to the Lord because he is good to me. So while we wait, we just came out of a season of waiting. Advent. As we waited and prepared for the celebration of Jesus' first coming. But might I say we are in a perpetual state of Advent because we are waiting and watching for his second return. When you think about it, God's people waited a long time for the Messiah to come. And now we wait. Anybody ever get impatient when they're waiting? Through each season in our lives, there are things that we wait on and for. You may be waiting for a cure to an ailment that you or a loved one has. Unfortunately, um, one of our church family is has a friend who is passing. What an awful wait. We wait for all kinds of things. I, I think back to a uh, previous ministry that I served at, and a gentleman by the Mil name of Milton walked in one day, and he just looked at me, and he was always this gruff, rough guy, and kind of scared me a little bit. But this day, there was a tenderness in his heart. And he said, Terry, why, why isn't God taking me home? He had COPD and he could barely breathe. Why isn't God taking me home? And I said, Milton, God's not done with you yet. He's got more things for you to do first. I put a smile on his face and he was ready to wait. But as children of God, what do we do while we wait? Today we're going to talk about what waiting looks like when we're waiting for things that we are wanting in our lives or that we want from God in our lives. But the very first thing we need to be is we need to be waiting with purpose. Now, what does waiting with purpose look like? I've already talked about several things that we may be waiting for. You might not be waiting on anything right now, but there's several things that you might be waiting for. And I take comfort in knowing that we're not alone. Each of us has something. But when we go to the scriptures, and I left my Bible over there, when we go to the scriptures and we open the scriptures up and we read the scriptures, what do we read? We read story after story. Mind you, true, just want to put this out there, true story, not made up fairy tales. These are true stories. This is the inherent word of God. And I just want to make sure anybody who's watching online now or in the future Here's that point, because too often we hear that they're fairy tales, and I'm not about that. Right now, I'm in Genesis, and Genesis is, 
It's almost like a Harlequin romance book. There's so much in it. But there's so much meat, so much good things. And we, we hear about Abraham who waited on God to make him a father. And not just a father, but the father of nations. And his wife, Sarah, she waited on God to bless her with a child. Remember how old she was? She was like 90. Can you imagine? No, no thank you. I mean, the grandkids wear me out now as it is. I can't imagine having my own that at this age all the time. Noah waited on God to stop the rain. David waited on God to give him the throne. Remember, he's anointed. But it takes a while. Ruth waited on God for her Boaz. The list goes on and on and on. That was just the Old Testament. Waiting is, well, quite simply a part of life. It's also a part of life that, quite frankly, is not my favorite. I find it very interesting the things that we have patience for and the things that we do not. As young parents, we're out and we have our kids with us and one of them, is, you're in the restaurant, your child is screaming bloody murder. As that parent of that child, you're like, I can't get out the door fast enough. As a parent of adult children who now have their own children, so we have and we, our grandchildren, we just sit there and we smile. Uh, don't you remember when we had our own little monsters like that? How mortified we were, yet now we're okay with it. And let's be honest, our impatience spreads far beyond our personal things. It spreads to God's promises and wonder comes about if he's going to keep them. That's Satan, you know, getting his foot in the crack of that door on you. But here's the thing. Read your Bible. And what do we see in the Bible? Every single promise that he has made, he has fulfilled. I had a uh, manager at one time that said, past performance predicts future performance. Well, if that holds true, God's past performances, he does what he says he's going to do, so that says he will do what he is going to do. And it's through the scriptures that we can remind ourselves of these truths. That is how I know that God is faithful. So under waiting with purpose, there's going to be three points. This is the first of them. Let's look at Deuteronomy 7, verse 9, where it says, Understand, therefore, that the Lord your God is indeed God. He is faithful. He is the faithful God who keeps his covenant for a thousand generations and lavishes his unfailing love on those who love him and obey his command. Now, I don't know about you, but a thousand generations just sounds like a really long time, so I had to get out the calculator because I'm not really all that crazy about math. And I did the math. And generation is, we'll just say 30 years. Some say 30, some say 35. We'll just say 30 years. 1,000 generations then is 30,000 years. Now, as believers, um, based on the Hebrew calendar, that means, you know, we're only a sixth of the way into that. But that's just like when he's, Jesus said 70 times 7. It's not that amount it's just an exaggeration saying it's forever and that's how i know god keeps his promises in the following passage from joshua the lord has just given all the land he has sworn to give them and he has given them rest from their enemies none of which could stand up to them which takes us to Joshua 21, 45, where it says, Not a single one of all the good promises of the Lord had given to the family of Israel was left unfulfilled. Everything he had spoken came true. Just one of countless, countless examples of God keeping his promises. 
And sometimes the hard part is remembering that God fulfills those promises in whose time? His, not ours. This is so true with our God that he does things in his time. Remember what the psalm says, a thousand years is a year, a year is a thousand years. His time is infinite. It doesn't fit in this little neat little box that we want everything to fit into. God has never not kept a promise. I just wish that was true for each of us. But I know God gives purpose in the waiting. Now, there's a secular movie out there. It was the second in a series. It was called Evan Almighty. Some of you may have seen it. It was, you know, Morgan Freeman. He is a Christian, so you know, him playing God kind of, it was okay. I was okay with that. But this is the, this is a scene. And let me set the scene for you. Joan, who is Evan's wife, is sitting in a restaurant. And she's distraught because of what Evan's doing. Evan was supposed to be a congressperson. And here's the exchange that happened. And Joan starts it off and says, oh, excuse me, can we get a refill, please? And the waiter, who is God, says, coming right up. And she says, thank you. And then Margaret Freeman's character looks at her and says, excuse me, are you all right? Yeah, no, it's a long story. Did you ever hear that from somebody? Yeah, no, it's a long story. You don't want to hear it. God says, well, I like stories. I'm considered a bit of a storyteller myself. At this, as I'm re-watching this scene on YouTube, I'm laughing at, my, at this because, yeah, God, God has some good stories for us to help us learn. And she says, my husband, have you heard of New York's Noah? And he says, yeah, the guy that's building the ark. He was pretty excited about that because, you know, he's the one that told him to do it. And she says, that's him. And there's some discussion back and forth about the original Noah's Ark. But then she says, but my husband says God told him to do it. What do you do with that? And this is the part that I like. Sounds like an opportunity. Let me ask you something. If someone prays for patience, you think God gives them patience? Or do you get, does he give them the opportunity to be patient. If he prayed for courage, does God give him courage? Or does he give him opportunities to be courageous? And if someone prayed for the family to be closer, do you think God zaps him with warm, fuzzy feelings? Or does he give them opportunities to love each other? Things that happen, so much to be learned while we God has a promise for everything that he does. Yes, waiting can be painful, but there is so much that can be found in it. And I guarantee if God is in it, it is not, nor will it ever be useless. Because we've said this many times before, God doesn't make junk. In 1 Corinthians 15, 58, it's, Paul writes, So deep, my dear brothers and sisters, be strong and immovable. Always work enthusiastically for the Lord, for you know that nothing you do for the Lord is ever useless. Now, there are many times that we may know, find out what the purpose of what God is having you do is. More often, though, you might find that there's no clue what God's purpose was for you in that way. God will never let your weight go to waste. And as I got to this point in writing, all I hear is Spirit of the Living God fall fresh on me. In 1935, Daniel Iverson wrote this chorus to Spirit of the Living God. It says, Spirit of the Living God, fall fresh on me. Spirit of the Living God, fall fresh on me. Melt me, mold me, fill me, use me. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh on me. So as we wait, God is molding, shaping, and transforming us. I pray that 
we would be constantly looking for God in all these things, including while we wait, and in doing so, that he would help us to discover the purpose of our wait. So let us worship while waiting. Now, if we are to worship while we wait, that means that we actually have to do something. And yes, it does seem somewhat counterintuitive to require action if you're waiting. You think waiting, you think of the waiting room. You're sitting in the chair waiting for your name to be called by the secretary or the person at the desk to tell you that it's your turn to go back and get poked and prodded by the doctor or have your teeth drilled by the dentist or whatever the case may be. But if God is molding us and shaping us and transforming us while we wait, that means we should be seeking him and how do we seek god we seek god through worship we are reminded in lamentations 325 and this is the english standard version where it says the lord is good to those who wait for him to the soul who seeks him waiting seeking there's action behind that wait but what does active waiting look like it can take a variety of forms, but our most natural response to this is that we should worship. And when we think worship, what do we think of? We think of singing and raise hands raised up high. In one of the videos we saw last week, uh, one of the songs that Pastor Mark had picked, the people were jumping up and down and singing and dancing and having a good time. That's one of the ways that we think of worship. And another way that we think of worship is going into our prayer space or our prayer closet or our prayer time, wherever that might be. Now, I didn't put this in there because I did I read it after the fact, but one of our favorite Bible study authors, Max Licato, recently uh, was praying and he prayed the same prayer for a couple of months. And then he found himself praying to God in tongues in a heavenly language and I thought this was beautiful this is a time between him and God it was in his private space in his space in his time with God and do you know what the world did Christians in the world did they came after him was there someone there to interpret it I was like um, wait a second He's waiting on God. He's praying to God by himself. That's between him and God. Doesn't need interpretation. But it just goes to show how impatient people are and how quick to judge people are. I think it's wonderful. And he is a wonderful teacher. He's just one of, of several that, that Mark and I uh, appreciate very much for the work that they do. Worshiping while we wait might also mean serving others. It's so very important that worship isn't confined to this hour, hour and a half that we're together on a Sunday morning or the couple hours we're together on a Wednesday night. It's not even confined to the, the 20 minutes or so that we sing. Worship doesn't even have to involve music. Well, those of you who like to sing, I'm sorry, but it, it is. In fact, every breath we take is an act of worship. Romans 12, 1 says this, And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. God has such a good and pleasing and perfect plan for us. We need to honor him, as Paul writes here, with our lives. And when we are truly worshiping God, how does that make you feel? Do you feel differently? For me, the things of the world when I'm in worship, or when I'm in that time with God, the things of the world just melt away. They don't exist. They don't matter. We saw a beautiful example of this 
uh, a few weeks ago. Mark was so ill, yet he came up here after being prayed over, after praying with, with Lori at home before they even left. And he came up here and he gave a powerful message. We didn't hear him wheeze, we didn't hear him cough, his voice didn't crack because God was there. Mark had entered a space of worship. There are so many things that happen that uh, when I'm in that same spot and that world, things have melted away, I'm not focused on my problems. Those seem to not exist in that space. I do know that it's very hard to put into words what worship for you may feel like. Because it's a, it's a supernatural thing with God. And when we worship we experience God's greatness and his presence. Psalm 100 verse 4 says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving, go into his courts with praise, give thanks to him, and praise his name. In God's presence we find comfort, we find gratitude. When we are in a season of waiting, it can be very hard to give thanks when our focus is not on but on what we're waiting on. Worship shifts our focus away from that and allows us to see the world through God's eyes. I realize that in waiting we feel like things may be out of our control and a lot of things are out of our control. We can't do anything about them. But do you want to wait well? you want to wait well then you need to start by worshiping God with your words and your thoughts and your actions everything you do needs to be for him when you go to work you work for yeah you work for the company that you work for and whatever but above that you work for God so the best way that we can do this is to pray while we're waiting now, worship should always be a part of our lives, waiting or not, but prayer is just another way for us to actively wait. We talk to God. When we are waiting, prayer can look very different than other times, especially if that wait is overwhelming. Instead of a, a just a normal conversation with God, you may be crying out to God. It may be all these different things that you're saying to God. Why? Why am I waiting? Uh, one of the shows that Diane and I like to watch is it's a reboot of, of the 70s show SWAT. And in this uh, reboot, uh, there's a character, and uh, he is just this upright family man. He's a man of God. I love seeing the fact that they allow that. And <laughs> still allowing it on TV. He's a man of God. But we learned a piece of his story on the last episode, and in that episode, we found out that when he was 21, he and a friend had gone somewhere, and he drove, He basically forced his friend to drive back late at night, and they were both really tired. Well, they both fell asleep. The car went off the road, and his friend was killed. In his prayer time, and he goes, I didn't grow up in a very religious family. We were CE Christians, as Mark likes to call them, Christmas, Easter. <laughs> and so I wasn't very religious, but I found myself, and this is after the, the, the pastor that had been the chaplain at the hospital had talked to him. He said, I found myself in the chapel where he took me, screaming at God and crying out to God. He was in a different place where he was praying while he was waiting for an answer as to why. That's why when we talk to God, we need to just tell him how we're feeling. He wants to hear it. Good, bad, indifferent, ugly. He wants to hear about it. And 
He can take all of it, all of it, and make something beautiful out of it. That's just who he is. And then all of a sudden in my brain, I'm hearing, you will bring beauty from my pain. And this is from a group that no longer performs, but they're, it's an old super chick song, Beauty From Pain. God does bring beauty from our pain. And yet God knows what you're thinking. He knows what you're going to be telling him, but he wants to hear it. And he wants you to be honest. If you're not honest with anybody else, even yourself, be honest with God. He can handle that honesty. He can handle our anger, our doubts, and our fears. Because like I said, he already knows every thought. Nothing's a surprise, so just tell him. The Bible tells us that God hears our prayers and answers those prayers. 1 John 5, 14 and 15 says, This is the confidence we have in approaching God, that if we ask anything according to his will, this is the important part, according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask of him. Will God always answer our prayer exactly the way that we want him to? No. Sometimes the answer is yes, sometimes it's no. And as today's sermon title says, sometimes it's wait. And then it still might be no. But I trust that God knows better than I do. He knows better. Let me rephrase that. He knows us better than we know ourselves. The scriptures tell us he knows every hair in our head. So as you are waiting, keep seeking and trusting God and that and what he has for you in the future. Keep waiting. Our call to worship came from Micah 7.7 7, and this is a verse that I think we need to be living out where it says, as for me, I look to the Lord for help. I wait confidently for God to save me, and my God will certainly hear me. But as I said earlier, waiting requires action, so we should serve while we wait. So take the time to serve. Your mind may be telling you that you don't have time to serve. I don't have time for that. Sometimes I barely have time to get the things I need to get done done. I look at the calendar. I, look, I check my to-do list. And they're all on this little gadget. Because I got them all the time. That's not counting. I'll wait the honeydew list that might end up on the counter or on the table. And so what are we hope for? Can I have a little more time? Just a little more time? But here's the thing, we blanked and what happened? For those of you that are parents or grandparents, your kids grew up. Now your grandkids are growing up. Last Saturday wasn't just Christmas for us, it was my, it was our daughter, our granddaughter Kelly's 11th birthday party. 11! I gotta quit blinking. Makes me wish I had that remote. Yeah, you guys remember the movie Click? Adam Sandler had the remote, he could fast forward or pause or or reverse time. Yeah. Can I have that clicker, please? The truth is, waiting takes time. <laughs> Seems a uh, foregone conclusion, but waiting takes time. So in the following passage from Hosea, we can see how serving ties into waiting. And this is from the message version. It says, what are you waiting for? Return to your God. Commit yourself in love and justice. Wait for your God and don't give up on him ever. See, when we are waiting, we should serve others. God has uniquely wired each of us to do certain things. And he, those gifts and talents were expected to use, not let them languish and never use them. Now, I'm not saying you got to go out and start a nonprofit or lead some movement to serve. But look around you at what God is already doing and how you can plug in with that. Now, Mark just mentioned in the announcements this morning that the men's group could plug in and 
cook breakfast for the winter. Serving. Serving while we wait for the women's group to kick off. In God's time. We got it. We can't force it. But he also says, don't sit back and not let anything not happen. Because we've heard the women say that they would like to do it. So maybe it's just God using us to give a little nudge. It might be another ministry, a church, or serving food at a, at a homeless shelter, or like First Pres or First Lutheran downtown. It might be tutoring kids after school. It might not have anything to do with ministry, but serving others. It could be any number of things. It could be as simple as going out your front door, because you see the neighbor outside that you've never talked to, and going up and talking to them. Here's the thing you got to be prepared for, because this happened to us. Introduced ourselves to a new neighbor, said hi, and got no response at all. Just to turn around and walk away. Wow. Okay. Um, I didn't have sandals on, but I'm thinking, okay, sandals. Get the sand off of them. That's all right. It could have been this, you know, like I said this morning, before I got into my... Going out and shoveling and cleaning off the cars, what did I do? I went and I spent my time with Lord. And I don't know if he gave me some super fast movement or whatever, because we've got one neighbor. Uh, he's in his early 80s, and he's got one of those driveways that's double wide and three deep. <laughs> Lots of cars in there. He only has two. And he had a stroke here a couple years ago. And he goes out and he still does his own yard work and stuff. There's no way I'm going to let him shuffle if I can avoid it. So I went in and I said, Diane, how much, what time is it? And she goes, it's quarter to eight. Sweet. Grab the shovel, run back outside. Shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. Went back inside. What time is it? It was two to eight. Good, I got time to get a shower and go pick up Doug. <laughs> it could be that you find yourself uh, signing up for a mission trip in another country might be any combination of the above. Serving doesn't have to be some massive thing. It can be something small. Pray and ask the Lord to open the doors of opportunities in the areas that he has gifted you where you can serve. Then, don't be surprised when he calls you to serve. Just go do it. Because he will lead you to use those gifts. And as we serve while we wait, we will quickly find that our focus will shift from ourselves to the people that we are serving. So in waiting, we are waiting to be transformed. God does a lot of work we don't see while we wait. It's that unseen work that he is doing in us where we are transformed, where we are healed, where we are made new. And while we are waiting, God continues that transformation. Philippians 2.13 says, For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. This is our assurance that while we are waiting, God is working. And I love this verse from Habakkuk 2.3. It says, this vision is for a future time. It describes the end, and it will be fulfilled. If it seems slow in coming, wait patiently, for it will surely take place. It will not be delayed. Now, it's going to be in God's time. Remember, We have to remember that, but it will not be delayed. It will be done in his perfect time. Have you ever considered that maybe the purpose behind the wait, behind the pain, is your transformation. We oftentimes don't think of that. But that can be a hard truth to swallow. See, in a world of instant gratification, a slow transformation can be so hard. But yet, Scripture just keeps popping into my mind. First one I was pulled to was the one I mentioned a couple weeks ago. For Psalm 46.10, be still and know that I am God. I will be honored by every nation. I will be honored throughout the world. In Psalm 
7a, or the first part of it, verse 7 says, Be still in the presence of the Lord and wait patiently for him to act. It's like God saying, just wait. My plans are so much better than yours. Transformation is a process, and waiting, well, it's a prerequisite. It's kind of like taking classes in college. You have to take this class to take this class. This is your prerequisite. You have to do this first before you can be transformed. But here's the thing, on the other side of transformation lies strength, perspective, and a newfound confidence. When we allow God to transform us through that weight, we are forced to trust him in new ways. I saw this in Jane's granddaughter. She's being forced to trust God in new ways as she's been traveling the world. We are forced to give God the reins and give him space to do what only he can do. Sometimes the purpose of the wait is transformation that takes place during the wait. Because at the end of that wait, it still might be no, but what happened during the wait? We were transformed and God used that. Once his promise is fulfilled in his way, we're able to look back those that 2020 vision that we always talk about hindsight's 2020 we're able to look back and see that we're all better for that weight oftentimes we'll come out of the weight looking a little bit more like jesus which was the point all along as we wait for god to move my prayer is that we won't lose sight of the fact that he is already working on our behalf. He is working in ways we can't see and in places we could never fathom. Father, as we wait to see what you have for us, let us do each of these things that we talked about. Let us wait with purpose. Let us worship through the weight. Let us pray through that weight. And let us serve through that weight so that you can transform us. And whether that waiting period ends with a yes, no, maybe, or not right now, that doesn't matter. Let us see what you have done to us and through us in that time of wait. Thank you, God, that you do all of these things. As we come into this time of communion this morning, and we're reflecting on the message that Pastor Terry gave us this morning, uh, I came to think of the time when Jesus, before he was crucified, was in the garden, and he was praying. And he told the disciples to wait for me a little while, and then I'll return. And he came back, and they were asleep. And so he went and prayed another time, and he says, can't you even wait awake for a little longer? And he went back and prayed again, and again he came back. And as we wait, and as we wait upon the Lord, and as we wait upon what he has planned for us in our lives, we, we have to think about those times where you know, do we wait patiently? Do we wait impatiently? Do we understand what God is doing in us and through us while we wait? See, a lot of times we're being formed and reformed. We're being refined as we wait. And so as we uh, wait upon the Lord, he will renew us. He will give us strength. And we will rise up like eagles and soar. We'll be transformed. We will be renewed. We will be refined through the waiting on the Lord. So 
I wanted you to think about that today as we're thinking about it and as we're remembering the sacrifice that Christ made for us. Are we waiting? Are we asleep? Are we sleeping? On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he had a meal with the disciples, and during the meal he took bread and broke it, and he said, This is my body which is broken for you. Take and eat. And later on, he took a glass and he filled it and he blessed it and he said, this cup is the new covenant. My blood shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Take and drink. And as the scriptures go on to tell us that each time that we are gathered together, we are to partake of the bread and of the wine as a reminder of the body and the blood of Christ, the sacrifice that was made for you. And for me. As we wait patiently for the Lord, we want to be reminded of that sacrifice. There's a purpose in the wait. If we go into John and we read the passage in John, he talks about he has a place to go and he's prepared a place for us. We have to wait for that place for him to come back and in the meantime we celebrate the fact that he sacrificed himself for us to make that place so that we could go and be with him we need to wait patiently the body of Christ broken for you the blood of Christ shed for you Anyone that would like prayer this morning? We're going to pray for Kim and her family. And mm -hmm. I have a co worker who just discovered that he has a very aggressive form of cancer. We don't know just what's, what exactly is going on yet. So, oh, no. what's his name? Uh, his name is Dave. Dave? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Anyone else this morning? Uh, I'd like prayers for my boss's family again. Um, yeah. We've been praying for uh, his wife, Kim, his father-in-law um, who did pass on Thursday evening so um, mm -hmm. we just want prayers for peace and comfort with them for the evening for folks. Okay and what's, what's the name of that family? Uh, that would be Dave Thomas. Dave Thomas. pray for my granddaughter Jenna that will be back traveling okay. down into Peru area of Brazil area that's not really safe traveling only as long as God's with her she'll be okay but so, she does a lot of ministry while she's traveling so. oh wow okay on her own she's not with no group really yeah, she's, she's a brave woman travel yeah travel safety I'd like to start this morning with Psalms 86, 11, 13. Teach me your way, O Lord, and I will walk in your truth. Give me an undivided heart that I may fear your name. I will praise you, O Lord, my God, with all my heart. I will glorify your name forever. For great is your love toward me. You have delivered me from the depths of the grave. Father God, we just want to praise you above all gods, above all things this morning. 
because great is your faithfulness and your understanding. None can fathom your love for us that never ends. So today I would like to invite the Holy Spirit into this church to rest upon us and those online that listen to your word. Bring a renewed heart and strength in our minds to hear your word and let it resonate with us. Stir up the desire to read your word, to seek you out and to follow you and to do your will and to help us seek you daily, Lord Jesus. And Father God, I'd like to pray for Dave who has cancer. Lord, it's the fear of the unknown. I just pray for him. Just give him uh, peace in his mind. Be with him through this trial, Lord Jesus, and walk with him. Help him to conquer the fear and to do your will in his life, Lord Jesus. I pray for um, Dave Thomas' family and his wife Kim and his uh, father-in-law that has passed away. I pray for their family, Lord Jesus. I pray for peace and comfort. Um, you know what's in their hearts, Lord Jesus. You know them. You search their minds and their hearts. You know them fully well. So I just pray that you will guide them in these days to come, Lord Jesus. And with Crystal, who has just found out she has leukemia, and she's having life um, problems as well, Lord Jesus. Just comfort her, Lord God. Help her to know that you are with her. Speak to her, Lord Jesus. And help her to find you through this trial. I pray for Jen, who's going to Peru and Brazil. I pray for travel mercies, Lord God. I pray for safety. I pray for a hedge of protection to be around her at all times, Lord Jesus. These are unsafe places that she travels, but you have called her to come to them. So I pray that you will give her divine intervention with everyone that she meets and help her to spread the word of your gospel to them, Lord Jesus. And just be with her and comfort her through these times. And Father God, I lift up Atlas and Kim's family for their friend Kim and her family. Kim is, you are walking Kim home to yourself, Lord Jesus. So Father God, the trials of this life are devastating when we lose the ones we love. Without you, our lives lose hope. So I ask that you open their minds and their hearts and you, O oh God, and give them comfort and peace that passes all understanding. When they are in their weakest times, gently remind them that you are walking with them. You will never let them go, Lord God, for you are a loving and faithful God. And we thank you for who you are. You are the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, the Prince of Peace. Isaiah 46, four says, I am he, I am he who will sustain you. I have made you and I will carry you. I will sustain you and I will rescue you. With you, Lord Jesus, we will always have be perfectly loved. So in Psalms 156, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And praise be to God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. or a passage within Isaiah 40 that has stuck with me since my youth. And it, it came back to prominence recently. Um, Carissa's uh, brother recently passed his board of review for his evil. And his friend just passed his. And so they'll be having their uh, ego ceremony soon. It took me all the way back to thinking about the things that I went through as I got my eagle. Mm -hmm. And part of that was spending two years finding fathers to be assistant scoutmasters. None of them wanted to take the, the top post. None of them wanted to be the scoutmaster. Mm -hmm. But our scoutmaster quit when I was 16. Just, yeah, personal reasons. No ill feelings up there at all. But it meant spending two years spending more time serving the troop. 
as I sat there with one thing to do, and I managed to do that in that first year, which was my ego project, and then I was done. But there was no one to send the paperwork over. There was no one to get any of those things done. Interesting how God works. Because in 1972, when I brought home that little, I think it was yellow piece of paper, you know, the type that ran through the mimeograph, that you know, that wonderful smell. I brought that home and I gave it to my mom. I said, can I go? It was the Cub Scouts. It was the big rally to get new scouts. And so she took me. My mom became a trainer for Cub Scouts at the council level and was working her way up from there when rheumatoid arthritis struck. But she never said anything to me about it. And so while I'm waiting to figure out how I'm gonna get my ego before I turn 18, my mom hops in the car and drives the almost two hours to the scout office, walks into the council president's office and he signed off the paperwork. It's all that needed to be done and somebody just to take it. It was ready to be signed. Everything was done. They just needed that signature and she did that the Friday before I turned 18. I waited a long time for that, and now I enjoy watching young scouts wait and go through that process. But I stuck this, this passage from Isaiah, it's 28 through 31, 31 being the most powerful part of it for me, but have you never heard, have you never understood the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of all the earth. He never grows weak or weary. No one can measure the depths of his understanding. He gives power to the weak and strength to the powerless. Even youths will become weak and tired and young men will fall in exhaustion. But those who trust in the Lord will find new strength. They will soar high on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. Have you ever found yourself not doing something for yourself, but serving God and serving others? And you all of a sudden have this strength and this stamina that you've never experienced before. That's what this reminds me of. When we are serving others, God will give us superhuman strength, superhuman stamina. Dare I say, we become like the Energizer Bunny. We just keep going and going and going. But that is how our God works. Our God. So let me send you out with the priestly blessing that the Lord gave to Moses to have Aaron and his sons bless the people with. And that was to bless the people of Israel. But as we know from the scriptures, this is meant to bless all of God's children. May the Lord bless you and protect you. May the Lord smile on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord show you his favor and give you his peace. For those of you that are online, thank you so much for joining us this morning. We are so thankful that you join us each week. The music that we will be singing next will be in a link. Uh, it was put out at the beginning of the service. We'll put it out one more time for you. Take time to worship through that music. Worship through your prayer and worship through your service. Go in peace.